Hey everyone, here's something I thought might be fun, or I hope it will be anyway. I wanted to compare the ride cymbal playing of a few of my favorite drummers, and I wanted to do this just to show the variety of different approaches these players had, and that there wasn't just one way to do things, and a lot of different things can work if they're done well. And what I'm looking at here, if you take the basic ride cymbal pattern, What I'm looking at here is how much did these players stick to that exact pattern, and if they changed it up, in what ways were they changing it up, because there are different ways you can do it. So the three drummers I picked for this, I could have picked a lot of different drummers to illustrate this point, but I chose Dave Tuff, Gene Krupa, and George Wetling. And I picked those three not just because they're three of my very favorites, but they have three distinctly different approaches to playing the ride cymbal. I think you could put them into three basic categories of ways you can approach it. And I think it's particularly interesting with those three because on paper anyway, there are a lot of similarities between them. They're all around the same age. They all came up together playing in Chicago. They all would be thought to be exponents of the Chicago School of Drumming. They all played with a lot of the same people, like Eddie Condon, and they had a lot of influences in common. Zudi Singleton, Baby Dodds, and Chick Webb were favorite drummers of all three of them. So it's interesting just how different they were in certain ways, and the way they played the ride cymbal is definitely an example of this. So starting with Dave Tuff, it's a little tricky to do this because Dave Tuff died many years before Gene Krupa or George Wetling. So if he had lived into the 50s and 60s, who knows what, we would have, what he would have done. But if you listen to the recordings that we have of Dave Tuff where he is playing a lot of ride cymbal, I think of uh, Bud Freeman and his famous Chicagoans from 1940. I always talk about those recordings, some of the greatest drumming ever. And Dave Tuff is playing on a ride cymbal a lot and also riding on a Chinese cymbal a lot. Uh, Jack Teagarden's Big Eight, also I think from 1940. Dave Tuff plays a lot of ride cymbal on there. And some things later on in the 40s with Charlie Ventura. When you hear Dave Tuff play the ride cymbal, he actually pretty much plays that exact rhythm without changing it. So he'll play things a little like... much play that rhythm most of the time without changing it up. Now, I'm not talking about things he did on the snare drum with his left hand or the bass drum or fills. I just mean the rhythm that he's playing on the cymbal. He pretty much will play that rhythm without changing it up. And that creates a kind of very uh, hypnotic sort of groove. Just because it's repetitive, in no way, to me anyway, does that make it boring? Dave Tuff is the furthest thing from a boring drummer. It's interesting when you hear these things to notice that the excitement that he's generating is not so much coming from changing that one specific rhythm up, it's more just his feel, where he's putting the time and his touch and his sound. Those, I think, we'll see with all of this, those are really the things that are important, these specific differences on the ride cymbal there are many ways you can do it and sound good, as long as it's really got a groove to it, and Dave Tuff certainly had that. And it's also interesting to notice that most of the generation that came after these players, people like Kenny Clark, Max Roach, Art Blakey, Shelley Mann, they all tended to play the ride cymbal much more the way Dave Tuff did. Obviously, none of them sounded like Dave Tuff, and nor did they sound like each other. But just in terms of the rhythm they were playing on the cymbal, it was much more similar to what Dave Tuff was doing, if you just wrote it out, than what Gene Krupa or George Wetling were doing on the ride cymbal a lot of the time. So let's look at those players. At slower tempos, Gene Krupa and George Wetling also both tended not to change up that pattern too much. But as the tempo got faster, they tended to vary it quite a bit, but they did it in different ways. Gene Krupa 
would change it up a lot quite often, and he would do it in ways kind of like this. So he's changing up the pattern quite a bit. Obviously, for all of this, you need to go to the source. I'm not being so presumptuous as to say, oh, here's what Gene Krupa sounded like, or this or that. But I'm just giving you the basic rhythms that they were playing. So for this kind of thing, uh, it's very easy to hear this on any of the recordings Gene Krupa made for Verve in the 50s, things in the studio, or jazz at the Philharmonic. If you listen to him behind uh, the saxophone solo on Drum Boogie with his trio, You'll often hear him do things like this. And so what he's doing here, he's changing up the rhythm, and he's doing that by sometimes he's adding notes to the basic pattern, and sometimes he's taking notes away. And specifically, sometimes he's adding an eighth note on the end of one or the end of three, and sometimes he's leaving out the eighth note on the end of two or the end of four not to be too overly analytical about it, I don't think he was thinking about it in that way probably, but just in terms of the rhythms that he's playing, that's what he's doing. So that's a very unpredictable kind of pattern. It's kind of constantly changing, and he can sort of change it in any way. His is the most unpredictable of these three, because sometimes he's adding notes, sometimes he's taking notes away. So with Dave Tuff, if you were to write out just what he was playing on the cymbal, a lot of times, measure after measure, it would be the same thing. Gene Krupa, often, there wouldn't be two bars in a row that would be the same. And again, there are many exceptions to all of this. I might talk more about that later. But that's kind of how what Gene Krupa would do. And George Wetling, also at faster tempos, would tend to vary the ride cymbal pattern a lot. But he didn't do it the way Gene Krupa did. George Wetling, almost all of his variations come from taking notes away from the basic pattern. Rarely did he add notes to the basic pattern. So George Wetling's thing was a little more like this. So there, you have a real quarter note kind of feel. George Wetling has the most quarter notes, I think, in his ride beat, because he's only taking notes away from the basic pattern most of the time. So that's another kind of feel, that real sort of driving quarter note feel. So I just think it's interesting with all of these players, as I said, there were exceptions to all of this. So there are plenty of times where Gene Krupa, let's say, will play that pattern without changing it. And he still sounds like Gene Krupa. So that's another deep thing here. Because you might think, well, that's what makes these players sound like who they are. But with all of them, there are exceptions to this, and they still sound like themselves. And any of these players, like Gene Krupa, still sounds like Gene Krupa if he's playing on the snare drum and not playing a ride cymbal at all. So it's a deep thing when you get into that to really start to think, well, what is it that makes these players sound like who they are? And I think, personally, that it's more about their time feel, everyone feels the beat in a slightly different way. It's more their feel and their touch. And that's, I think, what makes them really sound like who they are. And these specific things can kind of change. Like I said, there are exceptions to all of this, sometimes even within the same tune. But I think it's just really fun to notice these things. And I think another great lesson from this is just how all of these players were themselves and they did what was right for them. And I don't think, I'm just guessing, but I don't think that they were thinking about this too much in terms of, let's see, do I want to vary the ride cymbal pattern and how do I want to do it? I think they were doing what felt natural for them and that's the great lesson for all of us. These players found what worked for them and we need to find what works for us. And it's, a, it's really a deep thing because sometimes what works for your favorite drummer may not work for you. So it's really a thing about being honest with yourself about what your natural thing is. And I think another great thing about these players, like I said, there are exceptions to this, you'll hear them do different things. They were in the moment, and that's a big part 
of what made them great. Because I think maybe a lot of drummers can relate to this kind of thing where maybe you'll think, maybe you'll go to a gig and you'll get into a George Wetling kind of quarter note thing and the gig goes really well. And then you'll think, oh, that's the secret. It's playing a lot of quarter notes on the ride cymbal. That's what I have to do. And then you go to the next gig and now you're going with that preconception. Oh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play quarter notes. But now you're not in the moment anymore, and that might not be the right thing for how you're feeling that night. So just being in the moment and not having those preconceptions, I think, is very important also. So I hope this was fun, and I hope it draws some attention to these little subtle differences that these players had. And it's a fun thing when you're listening to any drummer, because you'll hear all of them do these different things at one point or another, even though they all had their tendencies. But listen to Joe Jones or Cliff Lehman or Buzzy Druton or Sid Catlett or Nick Fatul, Jimmy Crawford, all of them, and just kind of listen. What exactly are they doing on the cymbal? They do that for the whole tune or do they mix it up? It's a fascinating thing. So hope that was fun for everybody. Um, I love these drummers so much, so it's always great just to think about these subtle differences they had in their playing, and they all were great. That's the main thing. They all got to a great point with these different approaches. So it really just goes to show that anything can work if it's done well. So thanks everyone. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed. That's really nice. And I've gotten a lot of uh, questions and requests for different things. So I'm gonna try to get to all of that. Probably the next videos I do, at least a bunch of them are gonna be answering questions or requests. Uh, some of them might be short, some of them might be longer, but we'll try to get to all of that. So thanks a lot everyone. I'll be back soon.